How's it going, everybody? So, in the last episode of this little mini-series that we're doing, the history of the Earth, the beasts of the Triassic, we talked about how in the middle Triassic, there was an extreme shift in the climate that set the stage for a strange archosaur known as Hyperodapodon, and how we see them explode in numbers so great that they represent between 70 and 80% of the animal specimens found from Triassic fossil beds from around that time, and all across Pangaea. This impressive distribution is something that we hadn't seen since Lystrosaurus, a dicynodont that exploded in population in the very beginning of the Triassic, 18 million years before. And in the early Triassic video, we talked about how despite Lystro's abundance in the first million years of the Triassic, they quickly dropped off as new predators and competitors arrived to challenge them. Around a million years after the start of the Triassic, Lystrosaurus was gone. Which is sad because this animal survived the greatest mass extinction that ever happened on this planet. However, there would be a legacy. The story of the clade of Dicynodonts wasn't over yet, not by a long shot. And I received several comments in that video asking, if Lystrosaurus was so common, why didn't it diversify following the early Triassic? Well, as it turns out, even though Lystrosaurus was extinct, it did have many, many close relatives that continued on. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The Dicynodonts as a whole are very much considered a forgotten lineage today. But throughout the history of their existence on Earth, these synapsids were major players in their environment. Specifically during the Triassic, these were the most successful stem mammals, bar none. There were a few cynodonts that got a little bit larger, like Diodemodon, but for the most part, these were the most abundant synapsid in the Triassic period. They filled many keystone roles all over the world during the Permian. At this time, most were small burrowing herbivores that fed on roots and tubers. Yeah, I hate roots and tubers. Shut up, Tim Tim. Don't forget, 16% of the audience wants less of or none of you. Yes, but that means that 84% of the audience loves me. Yeah, well, questionable decisions of 185,000 people aside, let's move on. We talked about several of these creatures during the Permian episodes, and I also made a dedicated video to the ironically named Bulbasaurus. But this was the most common body type among the Permian Diocynodonts. A few got larger, but during the Permian, the role of browsers was kind of taken up by reptiles like Scutosaurus. In fact, Lystrosaurus was on the upper end of Permian Dicynodonts as far as size goes, at about the size of a small pig. But this body was clearly built to be a survivor. The Dicynodonts and the Cynodonts were the only two clades of therapsids to see any kind of success following the Great Dying. Lystrosaurus rose and fell within the first million years, but this sprawling browser body type would become the new standard in the Triassic, very likely finally being able to get larger with the absence of animals like Scutosaurus, meaning they basically evolved convergently with the reptiles that preceded them. And if you look at the skeleton, it's actually pretty clear. Their skulls are pretty different, but besides that, the skeleton of Scutosaurus looks very similar to, say, Placerius, which is a Triassic Dicynodont. Taking advantage of this vacant niche was the key to success at this time. Most of the Triassic Dicynodonts, like Placerius and Wadiosaurus, were between the size of a sheep and a cow, but they diversified to a remarkable degree during the Triassic, and took over as one of the most common large herbivores throughout most of this time. And one particular species at the end of the Triassic would break this mold. The most impressive Dicynodont that we know of at any time throughout Earth's history was actually only described in 2019, but the fossils were actually excavated between 2006 and 2014. You know how it goes, we talk about this all the time. The reason why it took nearly 10 years to fully understand what this animal was is 
because it didn't fit our obvious interpretation of Dicynodonts. The bones were massive, and from these we could determine that the animal that they found was around 4.5 meters or 15 feet long, and 2.6 meters or 8.5 feet tall, and weighing around 7 tons putting this animal at around the size of an Asian elephant. So until a very obviously Dicynodont skull was found, it was assumed that this creature was a different type of animal. Because based on our understanding at the time, they didn't ever get this big. As I said before, Dicynodonts were, at this time, predominantly low browsers or other species that continued to live that burrowing lifestyle. And ever since a Carnian Pluvial episode that we talked about in the Hyperodapodon video, a different kind of large herbivore stepped into the, this role of high browsers, the early sauropodomorphs. That's right everyone, in the back half of the Triassic, the synapsids and the other archosaurs of the past were finally sharing the world with the very first true dinosaurs. For a long time, it was actually thought that the Dicynodons were actually outcompeted by the Sauropodomorphs. But now, it's more widely thought that what was actually happening was a case of niche partitioning, when different groups of animals that live in a similar way or eat similar things specialize just enough to differentiate from their competition. So basically, the Sauropodomorphs got bigger and the Dicynodonts stayed relatively smaller, allowing both groups of herbivores to live alongside each other without directly competing. So before the skull was found, this beast was originally thought to be a species of high-browsing dinosaur but it turned out to be a massive Dicynodont, named Lysovichia after the town in Poland near where it was found. But if the Dicynodonts everywhere else were getting settled into the niche of being a medium-sized low browser, why did Lysovichia get so big? In order to answer that question, we have to look at the environment that Lysovichia called home. And as luck would have it, we actually have a lot of information to paint this picture. This region of Poland was, at that time, a warm, marshy conifer forest with a climate similar to the Florida Everglades. As expected, this type of habitat had an abundance of animal life, particularly well adapted to a wetland habitat. Lobe-finned fish, amphibians like the Timnospondyls, proto-dinosaurs like Sylosaurus, and small early pterosaurs being the most common small animals in the region. But what's interesting is there were no other Dicynodonts found in late Triassic Poland. The only other member of the synapsid lineage was a tiny early mammal, and there was something else missing that makes Lysovichia's great size make a little bit more sense. There have been no large sauropodomorphs found at this site, and this left an opportunity that other Dicynodonts around the world didn't have. It could get big without the competition of dinosaurs. And besides getting big, this animal also had a lot of other features that made it unique among Dicynodonts. For one thing, its legs were completely different. Unlike its relatives, which had legs that splayed out from their body, with Lysovichia, all four legs were directly under the animal. Which makes sense, it makes it more efficient for travel, especially when animals get a great deal larger. So instead of walking similar to a lizard, its gait was probably more similar to rhinos, elephants, or sauropods. Another one of the features that, before the skull was found, led scientists to think that this was a sauropodomorph. And oh, that skull. This was an impressive beast. Undeniably a Dicynodont, but still very unique among them. It had a massive crest on the back of the skull that attached to the neck and gave this animal a ton of power behind it, and a powerful beak for cutting through and crushing vegetation. It was like a living bulldozer. Now, most Dicynodonts are very much toothless, with the only exception being a pair of tusks in the top jaw. However, in Lysovichia and its closest relative, Placerius, we see the tusks get replaced by a three-pointed beak. This may have been an adaptation for having an easier time shearing vegetation, while the tusks were more useful to its ancestors which were doing more rooting and burrowing. But everything about this animal suggests that it had left that life far behind, and this was further proven by the discovery of coprolites. Lots and lots of coprolites. 
And for those who don't know, coprolites is fossilized poop. And as much as people scoff at the idea of fossilized feces, this can tell us even more about an animal than the bones ever could. Because with this, we could figure out exactly what these animals were eating. And it appears that these behemoths were literally eating trees. Much in the same way that we see elephants push down entire trees today, Lysovichia would topple over conifers and use its powerful beak to rip off branches and shear off bark, basically eating the entire thing. Fibrous plants like wood tend to be very easy to detect in coprolites, so this was very clear. But even though the sauropodomorphs did not seem to share this environment with the giant dicynodont, it did have to contend with dinosaurs. Well, sort of. We think, anyway. If you remember back like two years ago, we talked about a particularly mysterious Triassic animal. A predator named after an old legend of a dragon called Smok, and it was found in the same clay pit as Lysovichia. And I'll leave a link up above for you to check out that video and learn everything about Smok. But basically, it might be a dinosaur, or it might be a different branch of the archosaurs that evolved bipedalism, which we think was happening with different groups of archosaurs like Postosuchus. So its exact lineage is unclear, but what we do know is that this appears to have been the apex predator of the Triassic Polish swamps. And even the largest animal here was not immune to this nightmare. At least, not when they were young. We know this because fossils of Lysovichia have been found with marks consistent with predation. And the only animal that we know of in this ecosystem that was big enough to leave bite marks of this size was Smok. However, all of the signs of predation have been found exclusively on juvenile individuals. So by the evidence, it seems that at a certain point, Lysovichia grew to be too much for even Smok to handle. However, babies were still vulnerable. And when looking at the growth rings in the bones of these animals, we can see that they had a very fast rate of growth. This is a common feature among very large animals, especially when they have pressure from predators as babies that would struggle to handle them as adults. This is another thing that Lysovichius shares with sauropods. And really, that's one of the main reasons why I felt that this video was important to the History of the Earth series. More so than Lysovichia itself, Dicynodonts as a whole may have had an unspoken impact on the future of another group of vertebrates. Let me explain. Because if they were not sharing the world with animals that were already established low browsers, sauropodomorphs might have never adapted to become high browsers, and thus may have never started down the path that would lead to them becoming the largest land animals that ever lived. So to answer everybody's question, they did diversify after Lystrosaurus, and indirectly, they would have a hand in the creation of some of the most spectacular animals the world has ever seen. If you enjoyed this video, consider giving it a like, and comment below and tell me which other Triassic animals you think should get a little extra attention before we move on. So subscribe if you haven't yet, and share this video with anyone who enjoys paleo content. Have a good one, everybody.